<laughs> the kids who went for a hike, and he, you know, so they did a few things. All right, I'm going to start with the with the sponsorships, and we'll see what happens. Hopefully, some more people will join. Okay, so the Year of Learning is sponsored by Sue and Anne Gorelick in memory of Malka Pearl Mann and Philip Mann and all the survivors of the Holocaust. She will show her children and grandchildren in memory of their uncle, founding member BRS, Dr. Israel Brook, Masha Federbush and family in memory of her husband, Dr. Uriel Paul Federbush, Sharon and Fred Liska, their family and many friends in memory of their dear mom, Harriet Friedman, Leslie and Gail Kaplan in memory of their parents, um, Harry and Marjorie Sedell and Irving and Pearl Kaplan, friends of Avi Gittler and Martha Gittler, the children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Toby Paris, friends of Malka Levy, friends of Joe Wolf, Charlie Galfenstein and Sam Levine in memory of Ramona Levine. And then a month of learning is sponsored by Mordechai Miriam Bear in memory of his father, and um, by the friends um, of Yarm from Yarmouth E of Miriam and Michael Schiffer in memory of their son, Zev Dorvid Ben Shimon. David and Mindy Chesla in memory of his mother, Masha Federbush in memory of her husband. Um, a week of learning is sponsored by Shelley and um, Oscar Moll in memory of her father. Larry Fish and Vicky Robinovich Fish in memory of his father and her mother. Uh, a day of learning is sponsored by Masha Federbush in memory of her mother. A day of learning in memory is sponsored by memory of Herb and Judy Jeremiah in memory of his mother. And Ed and Ruth Goldberg in memory of his father. May all the Nishamot have an aliyah in uh, merit of our learning. So um, today, uh, in, pre in the previous classes, we talked about the Friday night service, and um, we went over the core four parts to the service on Friday night. Um, yeah, let me share this with you just so that we can. Okay, so basically, um, we learned that there's the Erev Shabbat Mincha um, is basically similar to the regular Mincha, except that there's no Tachanun. And also we add the Yedid Nefesh prayer to the Mincha. Then we also have Hadlakat Neirot, which is the lighting of the candles on Shabbat, which um, brings in Shabbat. And then we have the Kabbalat Shabbat, the welcoming service, which is the additional service, which we're going to focus on in today's class. And then um, the Shabbat Mara service um, for Shabbat and festivals. So that's what we focused on so far um, in the past five classes. And we've been over in detail um, what they're about. But now we're going to look into some of the prayers and in more detail of what they mean to us and what um, intentions we should have when we are saying our prayers. Um, so... As we already know, the Kabbalah Shabbat is the preparation service. It's basically the goal is to inspire us to accept Shabbat appropriately. So we do this on Friday night by, by reciting six yeah, Tehillim. Yeah. And the six, the six oh, Tehillim that we, that uh, we uh, recite. Uh, um, uh, uh, Robert, Robert, can you put your, yourself on mute, please? I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Okay, so the six Tehillim um, we say on Friday night are, ni are 95 to 99, which all talk about um, the messianic redemption. And then um, we, we end with uh, the Tehillim number 29, which basically focuses on the theme that Hashem is the master of, of the universe. Most commentators teach us that these six psalms basically allude to the six weekdays that we have just been um, we've just been through, and um, by by saying these psalms, we elevate the the six days to show that the six days are just focused on getting us ready and and dedicating our time to um, preparing for Shabbat, and in other words, to the day of when we will have spiritual elevation. So although we perform our menial task during the week. It basically reminds us that on this day, um, Hashem, rec we recognize Hashem, that Hashem is actually the master of all this material world. 
And during our six working days, we are waiting for, we are always waiting for Shabbat to come to, 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 to welcome Hashem's intense spiritual presence during um, Shabbat and, and with us. Um, if you actually look at the first um, numerical value of each of the letters of each of the Psalms, that means if you take the first letter of each Psalm and you add up, it's, it's Gematria, which is the numerical um, value, you'll see that the six Psalms add up to 430. And this basically is the same as the Hebrew word nefesh, which stands for the word soul. Um, so the Hebrew word nefesh adds up also to 430. So in other words, um, the idea is that these Psalms, because of the, the 430 connection, mm -hmm. is to imbue us with a spiritual exhalation and exaltation and serenity that are indicative of anashama yetera. Mm -hmm. So we believe on Shabbat that we get anashama yetera, we get an extra, extra um, soul on Shabbat with, uh, to, that gives us that extra spiritual uplifting. Mm. And basically we believe that that's what the, the 430 indicates in this, particular, in this particular thing. Now, if you um, look at the Psalms that we say, um, there are basically, according to the Malbim, two different levels of recognition of praise in the Psalms. So the first level of praise that we talk about or level one praise um, is basically when the nations and the world basically praise Hashem for the physical realization of his divine power over the world. In other words, for, for basically realizing that he has the strength and the sovereignty over controlling the world. In other words, by looking at the things in nature and the things that, that, that he does for us in general every day to make the world exist. The second, however, and more profound level of praise that will be sung, that is sung, is when the Jewish people actually recognize Hashem as their personal protector and king. And how basically we, we, we praise him for all the things that he's done for us over the years to look, to look after us. So if you look at the Psalms, you'll see that the first Psalm, Psalm 95, actually has two levels of praise. It will act, we're going to look at that today. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that they have both styles, the level one and the level two praise. Yeah. Whereas Psalms 98 and 97, uh, sorry, 96 and 97, mm -hmm. they have only one level of praise. Mm -hmm. And then Psalms 98 and 99, they have the level two praises mm -hmm. of where we're praising um, because um, the Jewish people are praising, not just the nations of the world. So if we turn now to page 95, uh, 95, 300, 308, sorry, 308. We'll come to the first, the first, the first, the first um, psalm that we're going to look at today. And um, we'll see that um, this is Psalm 95. So Psalm 95 um, was composed by Moses. Um, even though we do know that it was David in the end that actually compiled the book of Psalms together. But originally, uh, this was written by Moses. And basically, it begins with him um, making an appeal to the Jewish people to basically to join him in singing Hashem's praises, to thank him and acknowledge him as the sole creator and our guiding force. So basically, um, you see the words are, come, let us sing to Hashem, let us call out to the rock of our salvation. So we basically um, are, are calling out Hashem as being our guiding force, the, the, our salvation yes. and our, our guiding force. Yes. Um, if you look at the word, the first word, lechu, which is Hebrew, for come, it means come, it represents an enthusiastic appeal that urges one to surrender your doubts and leave your course of action, which you have become attached so basically by saying come, you, you're being invited to do something that you don't really know what you're doing, but you, you, you're being asked to leave behind and follow um, the call of doing, of doing something that you, you were busy doing. In other words, you're asked to forget your preoccupation with your material concerns mm -hmm. and join him in singing the praises of, of Hashem. Mm -hmm. um, on a personal level, also, if you look at the end of that verse, where it talks about the rock of our salvation, 
um, we suggest that Hashem has basically been our protector throughout as a Jewish people, mm. throughout the history. And no matter how imminent our destruction has seemed, he's always prevented the inevitable from happening. And we've always managed to survive because of Hashem's care. And that's what we basically are saying um, with this. Now, if you look at the next verse, it talks about greeting Hashem and giving him thanks. So we see that it's important that the first thing we do in, 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 when we start our praise is we actually greet and give thanks before for all his kindness and for all the things that Hashem has already done on, on our behalf. We see this as the respectful way to approach Hashem before we, see, we, we start pr um, praying for continued kindness in the future. So by, by looking at that verse, we see that that's what, that's what we, we do, and, and it's the appropriate way to approach God. In general, those first three verses of the, of, the, of, the, of the psalm, which also, if you look at the third one, says, for a great God is Hashem and a great king above all the heavenly powers. Mm -hmm. We see that they, that they remind us of the messianic era to come, when basically we will all recognize Hashem as a source of strength and salvation. If you look at verse three, particularly the one I just read, it particularly culminates with um, admittance of God's greatness and that his kingdom overall, including the angels and the heavenly bodies. Mm -hmm. They talk about the great king above all the heavenly powers, that even God mm -hmm. is power over the heavenly bodies and the, an and the angels. Um, we're on page 308, Chuna. We're doing um, Kabbalat Shabbat Psalm 95. So basically, that's, those are the first three verses. Now, if we look at verses four and five, these are the two that's, that speak of the, of the level one praise that I mentioned, where we discuss the things in nature that occur and that all the nations see and not just things that, that Hashem does for Israel. Mm -hmm. So you see uh, in that verse, for in the hidden power are the hidden mysteries of the earth and the mountain summits are he, for his is the sea and he perfected it and the dry land his hands fashioned it. Mm -hmm. So again, we see how um, the wonders of creation, like the tall mountains, the depths of the seas, the types of terrain of the earth, showing that Hashem is the master of every part of the universe from the lowest part to the highest part. It also shows that there's many natural phenomena that defy logic and, in human, and, and human investigation, but that God understands every aspect of nature, including the depths of the, every human heart. And he also understands the deepest of man's thought, thoughts. In fact, the, 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 the words of the mountain summits actually are a figure of speech referring to people who think they have hidden mysteries and plots, but they cannot keep um, them from being revealed to the omnipresent God. So we basically are, are in, this, in this saying that that Hashem is all around us in every in everything we do and in everything we see around us. And from the time we wake up in the morning to the day we go to sleep and we see all these wonders around us. Now, if you carry on to the next to the next verses, however, you see the level two praise in verses six and seven, because now you see they talk about come and let us prostrate ourselves and bow and kneel before God our Maker, for He is our God and we are. Sorry, for he is our God and we can be the flocky pastures and the sheep he is in charge of even, even today if we but heed his call. Mm. So if you look at those verses, you'll see that we speak, God speaks now more personally to the Jewish nation and invites us to express submission and gratitude to our maker. Mm. We believe he is our personal God and that we are his flock. So we, 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 we believe that he takes care of us in the same way that a shepherd takes care of its flock. Hashem takes care of us. Mm -hmm. in, verse, in verse six, we talk about prostration. Mm -hmm. Now, prostration, which is understood as a total submission to God's will, mm -hmm. is an attitude, not a physical activity. It means that when you prostrate yourself, you basically just give up, give up control to Hashem and you basically, um, you basically allow him to take charge of, of your life. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been proven that there are many times when um, Hashem, people have prostrated themselves in front of Hashem. And there are many stories in the Tanakh that um, they prostrated themselves. And as a result, because they have given over control to Hashem, Hashem has actually saved them and helped them. And the examples of that were 
Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moria, and the Jews in Egypt that were redeemed from bondage, and Israel at Mount Sinai when they were given the Torah and they prostrated themselves, and also when Hannah was looking to conceive a child and she prostrated herself at the tabernacle, um, with, and she later on uh, conceived Samuel. So we see that, that, that what is important is the prostration is the complete giving over of yourself to Hashem. It's not just a case of kneeling and bowing, but a case of completely giving over control, control to Hashem. So when we say those words, that's what we should think of, that we, especially as we're entering Shabbat, that we're giving over a complete control to Hashem now and that our six days of work are over, we're allowing um, him to take control of this particular day. Um, in, um, in verse seven, again, it focuses again on the, um, on the fact that we were a helpless flock of sheep when we were actually being guided by Hashem through the wilderness to eventually the promised land of Israel. Mm -hmm. But if you see at the end of the word, there's a very interesting um, line. It says, if you look, um, let me just see how I can show that to you. So if you count down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine lines down in the English, then you'll see there's like a dash and it says, even today, if we but heed his call, even today, if we but heed his call. Mm -hmm. So in other words, um, today it says that if even if we would actually listen to God's call, Israel would make it possible for Hashem to actually be, perfect his creation. You, we, we all know that God created us imperfect. Mm -hmm. And however, if we actually decide now to turn around and change and 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 follow his call and listen to his commandments, then he would be able to to um, to to perfect us. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the, one of the things um, we can think of is that if we actually would listen to his commandments and um, follow his ways and, and turn around and, and be, become a good people and everybody repents, mm -hmm. then he would be able to repeat these miracles that he did for us on the Exodus of, from Egypt again, even today. And that's, and that's an interesting belief to have. Mm -hmm. Because as we've discussed many times, one of the things we should believe is that the Messiah can come at any time that, um, that even in one hour or something, that's a, it's a possibility. And that we should always, we should always live in that, 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 that hope. So if all Israel would repent and even for one day could, could observe Shabbat properly, then basically that we believe that, son, that the son of David, the Messiah will actually, will actually arrive. So that, that particular small little sentence of even today, or in the Hebrew, Im hayom, hayom im even if today we will listen to Hashem, then um, things will be, changed, will be changed for us. The, the, if you continue with um, this particular psalm, um, you now get to verse 8. And um, the remainder of the psalm actually is... Um, basically a, a reminder of the times um, because remember it's Moses that composed the psalm so as a result Moses is now reminding us about the times in Egypt when we didn't listen to Hashem and we're not, not in Egypt sorry in the desert when we didn't listen to Hashem and we didn't believe in the miracles that we saw and um, he's basically reminding us this as a warning to make us um, sort of turn back so if you look at um, verse eight, okay, which says, um, do not harden your heart with, the, with, with us at Mirbe as of the day of Masai in the wilderness, when your, when your ancestors tried me, they tested me, though they had seen my deed. So um, this particular uh, basically talks about the instances when the Jews defied God in the wilderness, and refused to put faith in him, even though they were the ones that were privileged to witness all these miracles that God did for them. Mm -hmm. Remember, he gave them, um, he gave them, he surrounded them with clouds that protected them. He led them with pillars of fire and clouds. Mm -hmm. He gave them manna. He even gave them water mm -hmm. um, at that place that they mentioned there, Mirabah and, and Masa. Those are the two places where the water, one was the water was, was from the rock. And the other one, the water was, um, the water tasted bitter in, the, in a well, but then he made it taste sweet for them. Mm -hmm. 
and all of these the things they saw but he still he still didn't um he still didn't um they still didn't listen to him so there's an appeal here for hashem not to harden his heart because of what our ancestors did but to rather to judge us on our own merits and to rather forgive us and deliver us and to, and to bring the messiah for us even though our ancestors were stubborn and and didn't 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 see what they said what what he's what he did and what he did for us if you then look in um in uh, verse number nine it, which carries on about it talks about um, the miracles again in the wilderness and um it talks about how for 40 years they were the people were an errant an errant people and they were an angry generation and how they didn't listen um to, to Hashem's good, good deeds that he did for them. And they continued to complain and lament and, um, and, not, and they were not happy with what the things that, that Hashem did. And so he, he, that stress is that we too should, to, in today's world, should look for miracles that we see and try and see if we can, if we can see these miracles and, and not, not, not look only for the bad things and the things that are not, that are not good in our lives, but try to see the good things as as miracles and positives, and and look look for that that in our life. Um, if you then carry on to verse ten, he talks about the 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 forty the forty years. Uh, sorry, hang on, verse ten. Where am I? Uh, the uh, the forty years. Then I said, oh, oh he said. Um, and something about, and they did not know my ways. So again, he talks about the fact that, 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 that the children during the 40 years, they did not listen to his words and they rejected his instructions. In other words, that um, Hashem didn't, didn't want to convey additional information to, this, to these rebellious people. He basically cut himself off from them for the 40 years and decided to wait until they died in the, in the desert. So we should understand that Hashem's punishments will be harsh if we don't follow him as well. So yes, there's that, that sense of that we should love him and we should care about him and try and get close to him. But we should also always understand that there is a punishment um, for if we don't follow, if we don't follow in his, his ways. Um, if you get to the end of the verse, the last verse is again an appeal to, to us, to people that, 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 Hashem, we, we've asked Hashem that his his um, his wrath doesn't continue with um, afterwards after when we enter the land. So, so in other words, we we basically are again at the very end of this particular psalm. We are appealing for him to not repeat. We are appealing for him that we won't make the same mistakes as what our forefathers did. That we will be understanding, and we will make sure that we follow in the ways of Hashem and understand what's going on. So that we will be able to to um, to to make to repent and and to be sorry for the things that we've done wrong, and as a result, we won't make those same mistakes of our forefathers. Um, I read an interesting thing about this particular psalm. Now that we're concluding it, is that when you dive in um, and you say the psalm, that one of the things you should stop for a moment and imagine is that this psalm gives you hope. Um, to think about a future and a world where there's no war, where there's no strife, where there's no terror, where there's no dying. And you can basically envision a world that one day there'll be a world of truth and a harmony and beauty again. And Hashem will reign and, and Hashem will again show his face and his miracles and take care of us. And, and there'll only be good things um, that, we'll, that we'll see every day. So that's a uh, an important thing to focus on when we say this particular this particular psalm. So I hope that helps a little bit, give you a little bit of enlightenment about each of the different verses and the different things that the, the psalm says to you. Any questions on that before I go to the next one? Shona, I see you nearly, you're nearly thinking of something. <laughs> <laughs> okay all right so let's carry on then to psalm 96 i only actually prepared two for each day because they 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 there's a lot of detail in each of them okay so now this psalm 
if you look at the psalm, the very first verse, verse of Psalm 96 says, sing to Hashem a new song. So this psalm is about singing to is, is about singing a new song because in the times of the Mashiach, when all the nations of the world will change their outlook about Hashem, everyone, every man will arouse his neighbor to praise God with these words. So, so even though um it's a new it's a new song. It'll be a new song in the sense that everybody will be singing a different tune to what they were singing before. So when people used to have doubts about Hashem and people used to not believe that Hashem was the only God and everything, when this new song is going to be sung, everyone is going to believe there will be one God. As we speak about all the time when we say the Shema, our goal one day is that everybody will identify that our, that Hashem that we know, and that's our protector and our rock of salvation. He'll be the one who everybody will recognize. So um, this psalm was actually again composed by, by Moses. And um, however, it was adapted by David because um, he used it um, when, when the, the Holy Ark was being redeemed from the capture of the Philistines. Um, during um, one of the, the battles that they had when King David was um, king, the, um, the Philistines, were basically um, captured the holy ark, you know, the tabernacle of the, that, that we used to dive in with and everything. And um, J David actually was able with his, with his army and his war to capture it back. And when he captured it back, he, he took the psalm as a psalm to celebrate and to say thank you to Hashem because now they could eventually dive in again with the, with the holy ark. And for that, that for them himself was like a, a celebration of 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 the of um them being um them being happy and believing that this was the start of them again being able to be released from exile um so basically um this psalm focuses again as i said mostly on israel being finally released from exile and from the jews joining the messiah and being able to exult so um Let's talk a little bit about what things will actually change at the time of the final redemption or the Geula. Um, first of all, as we've mentioned again many times, the entire world population will recognize Hashem as the God of the whole universe, um, not just the Jews. The entire world will also realize that there is no other power besides um, in the universe besides Hashem. And also... The, the physical world that was that was kind of lost when um, when when um, Adam and Eve were taken out of the of Gan Eden, the physical luster will actually and the shine will actually return to the world. So things that, however beautiful we think the world is now, will, it will seem even even more beautiful at the time of the Messiah. And um, you know, as we've already mentioned, there won't be sadness, just just happiness. So that will that will make a big difference to our outlook on life. Um, so now, if we slowly look at each of the verses, so the first verse, as I said, is sing us, uh, sing to Hashem a new song, sing to Hashem everyone on earth. So as we as we've said, um, that's that. Um, the in what respect will the song be new? The the idea. Is, in the, is that in the past when good triumphed over evil, evil always sort of reoccurred. So that yes, there would be, you would always have these battles and then evil would be, would be, would be pushed down, but then all of a sudden the, 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 it's, it would raise its head again and evil would reoccur. So basically the idea is it was never, evil was never completely vanquished. However, in the future atmosphere, when the Messiah comes, it's believed that it will be completely purged um, the, the world will be completely purged of every detrimental influence and the final victory will be sturdy, strong and enduring and no more evil will exist and they'll only be, they'll only be good. So that's what, this, that's what the song is, is saying when it says it'll be a new song and everyone on earth will, will see the good and, and the good will remain for everyone on earth. Um, is that okay for that verse? All right, so now if we look at the next verse, sing to Hashem, bless his name, and announce his salvation daily. So again, this reminds us to bless Hashem in kindness, and he will show, and, and basically about the fact that he will also show kindness when he will gather the exiles 
and he will continually remember this event daily. So as soon as um, the, the Gauda comes, it won't be a case of just, as we said, that it'll last for a short amount of time. It will be lasting daily and, and everything will be good good daily and Hashem will, will, be, will be eminent and um, seen in the world all, all, the, all the time. So, so we, we should not take things for granted. In the meanwhile, even now, while we're waiting for the Gula to come, we should recognize seamlessly innocuous events as heavenly gifts and miracles. As I mentioned earlier, it's always good to look and see in your life for the things that are, that are, that are good and that are positive and focus on those and, and thank Hashem for, for helping you with those. The, the important thing, we do this by proclaiming it publicly and renewing it with joy. And, we felt, and if, we do, and if, we, if we, we do that, then we can feel the same thrill and feeling with something that has just occurred. So even if we remember something that happened a while ago that was good, um, not necessarily in the, you know, in the, recent future, the recent time, but that in itself, if we can keep thinking back even to good things that happened before, and that in itself can give us joy and, and renew the feeling for us, then that too is, that too is, is important. Okay, if you look at the next verse, um, it says, uh, where am I? Three. Relate his glory among the nations, among all the peoples, his wonders, that Hashem is great and the sin he lauded, awesome, and he's above all heavenly powers. So again, um, if we speak of the world's chorus of Jews, of how Jews and non-Jews alike, they all will together praise Hashem in a firm, united faith in one God. So um, that's what we believe is going, is going to happen when the Messiah comes, that everybody will, will say how God is great and exceedingly praise him as awesome. And he will also be glorious because he will basically honor and glorify Israel in the, in the, in the presence of nations. And everybody will be able to see how God has supernatural wonders and everything that Hashem does will be obvious to, 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 every, to, everybody, to everybody. And even above all the heavenly powers, again, is mentioned. The heavenly powers, remember, we talk about all the angels and the celestial beings that are in the heavens. And, um, and we, again, show how Hashem will, will be above all of these things. And we'll know that he's the greatest um, of everything. In verse four, you see, for all the gods of the, we're going over on to page 310 or 11. All the gods of the people are nothings, but Hashem made heaven. Um, so again, verse three, again, uh, sorry, verse, where am I? Verse five, the man, okay, so now we see that the man-made gods are described as being nothing. In other words, things that were created and invented by man, okay, and we've discussed this before, that includes things like, like money and power and all these other things that 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 are, thing, are, are worth nothing and they have no value and are also worthless as opposed to Hashem. Because Hashem is the person who actually created the heavens and not only the heavens, but he also created the celestial bodies that the idolaters um used to worship that used to worship. So we 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 in this in this state we 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 at one stage we say we we deny the the idolaters gods that are that are nothing the the idols and are nothing, but at the same time we glorify Hashem because of the fact that He made the heavens and the earth and He is the creator of everything in nature, including all the things that that um, that um, people have worshipped. But He actually made those 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 things, and therefore, um, if they're actually worshiping them, they theoretically are. Uh, recognizing the creator of all okay the next verse glory and majesty are before him might and splendor in his sanctuary okay so this verse talks about the intrinsic uh, glory again of Hashem's places in all creations um, his sanctuary is again um, not just the place where we pray but also the the heavens where the prayers the prayers go to um, where, where Hashem hears us, and basically, um, it it's um, it expresses reflected back to the external majesty, which in, 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 in turn uh, returns to Hashem. 
So um, glory is what Hashem creates, and it's actually an, an internal, an internal, um, what did I say, an internal, an intrinsic glory that Hashem actually places in everything he creates. And then as a result, um, majesty is what's um, reflected back as an external, um, back to Hashem. So in other words, what we do is we see that there's an inner might which fortifies God and an external splendor which impresses all who behold it. So Hashem, well, Hashem actually is the one who, who all our, all our, all our goals and all our achievements are actually a reflection of, of Hashem and that he's the one who gives us the ability to be able to do all the things that we as human beings can do that, that, that um, animals and, and other objects in the world are not, are not able to do because he has given us that glory to reflect back in, in the world and to affect the world. Um, in verse seven, I keep getting lost here because they're not numbered here. In the book I was reading them, they were they were numbered. Oh, uh, here. Render unto Hashem, O families of the peoples, render unto Hashem honor and might. So again, um, verse, seven, verse seven, it implores you to attribute, to ascribe, to bring, to give and to prepare, to give your praises and glory to Hashem and to recognize his honor and his might. In other words, you need to basically, in this, in this, um, in this verse, you need to understand that that there's a lot of effort on your part to to actually be able to to ascribe the fact and 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 give and 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 praise Hashem for all the things that 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 He does, because by doing that, you you recognize His honor and and His might. Um, all right, the next verse, um, which is, uh, render unto Hashem honor worthy of his name, take an offering and come to his courtyards. Okay, so again, this one is talks about um, the great, the, the fact that we have to make sacrifices um, and offer him our human energy and our resources. So we need to we need to dedicate ourselves to Hashem in a way that we make sacrifices and that we we give our, our human energy and resources to perform mitzvot and to do prayers and to do um, good deeds and 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 activities that bring us close that bring us closer to to Hashem in a way that we actually um, attribute His greatness and show that he, that He is the King and He is the He is the leader of 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 everything and the Torah that we that we follow. Uh, in verse nine, now why do I keep getting lost? <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> Somebody help me here. Um, oh, we're back at uh, prostrate yourselves. Is that where we are again? Mm -hmm. Yeah, prostrate yeah. yourselves before Hashem in His intensely holy place. Tremble before Him, everyone on the earth. Okay, so again, this verse again refers to being, as I said, prostrating yourself, which is the ultimate giving over control to Hashem. But also when they talk about his holy, intensely holy place, they're talking about the holy temple, which basically is always a source of sanctification and always the place that we, that we dream of one day in the messianic era will be rebuilt and that we will be able to, to, um, to, to be there again to pray to Hashem. But in the meanwhile, this verse also stresses for us that it's really important that whenever we are going to pray to Hashem, that we should be imbued with a sense of awe and reverence. The words tremble before him and everyone on earth is an idea that when we are praying to Hashem, we should always think of, of the awe and the, the reverence that we feel that we that we talk, that we're talking to him and that we should um, feel that we that we can con communicate with him mm. in that time mm. um in the time of the, the 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 messianic era it's believed that the nations who have failed to fear god um before when it comes when the messiah comes they will actually feel that fear mm. and see how great god is and actually also feel that trembling that 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 we've as of as of now as jews should feel every day when we pray or when we do mitzvot and when we think of 
of Hashem in, in that way. And then um, the next verse, which is 10, says, Declare him among the peoples. Hashem reigns. Indeed, the world is fixed so that it cannot falter. Um, uh, uh, I don't know why I keep losing my place today. Um, okay, so in this, so in this verse, um, the people basically that have we we believe that the people. Oh yeah, sorry. We believe that the people that have um, reigned with Hashem and fixed, they cannot falter. Um, so we believe that the people who have brought sacrifices and will return what they've seen with their own voices, and they will basically say that God is reigning and God is the king. And so people have actually will, will, will go and declare to other peoples once they've actually been to take sacrifices to the temple and have delivered things. Um, and they will come back and say that they, Hashem reigns in the king and God will basically bring an additional stability to earth so that man will feel it and see a lasting peace. So as we mentioned many times again, that again, when the Messiah, Messianic era comes, we'll see this lasting peace where good will be rewarded and the bad will be punished and the evil will no longer exist and only the good, only the good will remain will remain again. So um that's that's what that's what will happen it will fix it's the world will now become fixed and it will no longer falter that's what those words mean that that the, the good will remain and the and the evil will be will be will be taken away forever okay now he will judge the people with fairness he will judge the people with fairness okay so this again continues with the fact that um that he will that that he will bring um, stability, and that the, the good will be rewarded, and the the good will be and the and the and the the bad will be punished. Okay, now we come to the line: the heavens will be glad, and the earth will rejoice, and the sea and the fullness will roar, and the fields in everything it will exult, and all the trees in the forest will sing with joy before Hashem. For oh, hang on a minute, this verse ends. For He will arrive, and He will have arrived to judge the earth. So in this verse, we talk about how when the peace will actually sweep the universe and happen with happiness and optimism, the components of, no, of nature will actually signify the joy by carrying out their functions. What will happen is the, the heavens will produce rain and dew, and the earth will produce general crops. And in turn, there will be a fullness of, in the sea with fish and food and the, and the on the on the grounds and everything and so there'll be no more famine and no more um and no more um lack of 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 um, natural elements anymore basically god will will bring all this, these joys as it says to the fields to the trees of the forest and also finally as i said to the to the um the seas and the and the earth and the heavens will all be Will all be filled with with um, generous results of fullness and and fields. In the in the verse, um, also we we see that the animals of the field and the beasts of the wilderness will also exult together. So and all the barren trees and and will eventually produce luscious fruit and all the wonder and and this and will all be and all and all who see this will actually be wonderful and sing joyously. So what will happen is that the Hash, that Hashem will see that there will be a, a, a real joy in the world and a happiness and um, result in that. In concluding this particular verse, you see that um, it says that there is, um, if, you, if you see the verse, it says, um, for he will have arrived, he will ha have arrived. You see the have arrived is said twice to judge the earth and he will judge the world with righteousness. So we see that the uh, Hashem arriving is repeated and the word judging is repeated in those two verses at the end. And the idea is that basically when Hashem will come at the end of the messianic time, there will actually be two, two tasks that he will have to perform. First of all, um, he will manifest himself as the one whose hand controls the laws of nature and thereby he will convince everyone that he is one. And he is the only God. So that will be his first thing to basically that he will arrive to prove that he is the only one and that he controls everything. 
And secondly, as we've mentioned before, he will perceive as the one who judges the deeds of mankind. And in other words, he will basically um, get, uh, show his um, understanding and compassion on people who have tried um, to do good deeds and mostly, and, and basically he will save those who, who have been good and destroy those who have been bad. Um, and finally, it, what will happen is, as it says, in the end, um, it, the people, it, he, will, he will show the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. By his truth, they're talking about all the prophets um, who have basically spoken about the Israel's redemption. And basically, um, they talk about the doom of other nations and that will be confirmed of nations who've been against Israel and have made Israel suffer. So in this case, um, the truth is just the fulfilling of all the different prophets, prophecies of the Messianic era and the fact that that, that, will, that, will, come in, that will come into being and there will be true peace and um, everything will, will, be good, will be good in the world again. Um, in, in the conclusion, when you think of this particular psalm, again, I read an interesting <sighs> thing that said, you should think of it about the psalm basically makes you reflect about looking at nature, such as the mountains, the oceans, the trees, the stars, the waterfalls, um, the, the fish, the, the, the crops, the food, the snow, and consider how all of these are the handiwork of Hashem and how in, 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 as we see all of these things around us on a daily basis, we should be grateful for them and on our way, we should actually praise, praise Hashem. So basically, um, that's the introduction of these two, these two psalms. And um, they basically show you how um, you should, when you, say, when you say them, you should, you should think in a way of, as I said, the messianic future of what, what's coming. And in the meanwhile, look at what you do see already today so that you can already thank Hashem for those things. And then, and then as a result, Please, God, will bring Mashiach soon, and things will be will be good and and better in this in this world. Amen. So that's all I've got for today. Are there any questions or anything? Um, when you said things will be good again, I wondered when they were. Well, theoretically, when when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden, things were good. <laughs> A while ago. <laughs> right yeah i should maybe not sit again but i said we believe they will be good just be good that's all everything will just be, be good. good that's all we're good. We have to we're hope. We're all right to hope. okay and i'll see you guys when we actually women... got... i've actually, no, I've actually... No. when we women dive in at home when we yeah. women dive in at home friday night do we have to say all these songs yes these six yes, songs? yes yes for sure oh for sure definitely that's yeah. definitely part of the service. Yeah, you definitely say it all. Yeah, they're very important. They're very important prayers to say because of, of the idea of praising Hashem. And, and as I say, uh, believing in the... We always believe that Shabbat is, can be the start of a messianic era. So therefore, we always believe right. we, start, we should start with those prayers at the beginning of the, of, the, of the evening of Shabbat to welcome Shabbat and to start with it. Because in the end, ultimately, the, the whole, we believe that when the Messianic era comes, all days will be like Shabbat, peaceful and restful and, and um, you know, no more Taurus and troubles and stuff like that. So that's what we pray for. All right. Any mm -hmm. other things? Anybody? All right. We're, okay. We're, Have a good week well. with us. All right. If I'll see you next well. week. If Thank you very much. Well. We're leaving Wednesday for Israel if all goes well. Okay.